Mathematics disproves evolutionism. When asked for any mathematical evidence for their worldview, evolutionists can never give any examples. No equations, no formulas, no calculations whatsoever. How can they possibly call it scientific? In fact, mathematics actually disproves evolution with the Hardy-Weinberg law and the Price equation, which necessarily indicate that no changes occur in a population. Evolution is a failure. So why do all these supposed scientists keep pushing their religion as hard science when the math can't back it up. I had to investigate. When Charles Darwin published On the Origin of Species in 1859, DNA had yet to be discovered. Darwin was aware that a mechanism for inheritance must exist in the cell, and calling it a gemule, he postulated that it must be located in the nucleus. In 1865, Gregor Mendel, Augustinian friar and abbot of St. Thomas's Abbey in Moravia, presented his paper on experiments on plant hybridization. He showed relationships between the frequency of particular traits in pea pods, such as seed shape, flower color, pod shape, and even plant height. Possibly the best known example of this is smooth versus wrinkled peas. The assumption of the day was that hybridizing the two should produce a median phenotype somewhere between the wrinkled and the smooth surfaces. What he discovered instead was that these traits do not blend. It is either one or the other. Beyond that, he also showed that the smooth trait was dominant so that even if a pea plant possessed both smooth and wrinkled alleles, it would only express the smooth trait. Wrinkled traits were only produced when breeding two copies of the recessive wrinkled trait. Mendel's work was largely largely ignored by the scientific community until it was rediscovered just before the end of the 19th century by Karl Korins, Eric Schermach von Seisenegg, and Hugo de Vries. Understanding of Mendelian inheritance was made easier in 1905 when Reginald Punnett introduced the Punnett Square, giving a visual representation of the probabilities of dominant versus recessive traits and their expression. As visually helpful as the Punnett Square was, there was a lingering problem that hadn't been resolved. How, in a population of dominant and recessive traits, did the dominant trait not completely overtake the recessive traits, completely replacing them. In 1908, Godfrey Hardy in England and Wilhelm Weinberg in Germany both independently published papers outlining the same mathematical principle, eventually known as the Hardy-Weinberg principle. In a given population with a dominant P trait and a recessive Q trait, we can determine all members that have the P allele by simply counting the members expressing the P trait, known as the P phenotype. In this case, 91. We can also determine all members with two Q alleles by counting the number of members expressing the Q phenotype, in this case 9, in a gene pool of two alleles. The frequency expressing the P phenotype plus those expressing the Q phenotype will always be equal to 100% of the population, or 1. This can be expressed as P plus Q equals 1, but it cannot tell us how many of the members expressing the P trait have the double P or the PQ alleles. Since it's a matter of two copies of two alleles, the equation can be corrected to account for two times the alleles by simply squaring it. Breaking the equation down, we can express it as p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1. This is the Hardy-Weinberg equation. Knowing the number of QQ members in the population is 9%, getting the square root, we arrive at 30%, the percentage of the population with that gene. Subtracting that number from 1 to get 0.7, and then squaring it, we get 0.49, the 49% that has the double P alleles. From there, we simply multiply 2 times P times Q to get 0.42, or 42% of the population with both the P and the Q alleles. According to the Hardy-Weinberg law, these percentages remain constant in a population. This is also known as Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. As I've covered in previous episodes, the laws of physics apply absolutely in ideal conditions. The laws of thermodynamics assume a closed system since any change in the system's energy offsets the predictions. Boyle's law assumes completely kinetic activity between particles with no electromagnetism or any other interaction. Hardy-Weinberg's assumptions are 1. That the population is diploid, containing two sets of each gene from both parents. 2. That there is no natural selection acting to favor either allele. 3. There is no sexual selection to favor either allele. Each member of each generation mates randomly with one individual. 4. There are no mutations. There is no mechanism for creating new alleles or variants of alleles. 5. A gigantic population. Smaller populations are more susceptible to genetic drift. And 6. 
there is no gene flow, no interactions with other populations to add or remove alleles from the population. Knowing that no population on Earth follows these assumptions, the value of Hardy-Weinberg is not that it accurately depicts allele changes, it does the opposite. It gives us a blank canvas to measure changes in allele frequency. In the 1920s, both Alfred J. Lotka and Vito Volterra independently published the same set of equations describing and predicting statistical relationships between predator and prey, as well as competition for resources. In 1930, Ronald Fisher published the Genetical Theory of Natural Selection, noting that the rate of increase in the mean fitness of any organism at any time ascribable to natural selection acting through changes in gene frequencies is exactly equal to its genetic variance in fitness at that time. While employing some mathematical principles, it did not become a formal mathematical theorem until George Price published Fisher's Fundamental Theorem Made Clear in the journal The Annals of Human Genetics. In this paper, Price fully realized Fisher's concept on changes in fitness with the Price equation, which paved the way for Price and John Maynard Smith to co-author their paper from the journal Nature, The Logic of Animal Conflict introducing game theory into biological evolution and producing mathematical models for the development of altruism. In 1949, John Burden Sanderson Haldane published his paper, Suggestions as to Quantitative Measurement of Rates of Evolution. In one equation, x1 and x2 are the initial and final values of a particular trait, respectively. Delta t is the change over time, usually expressed in millions of years. Subtracting the logarithm of x1 from the logarithm of x2 and dividing it by delta, we end up with r, a quantifiable rate of evolutionary change, which he named a Darwin. In 2013, Jeremy L. England published his own set of theorems in the Journal of Chemical Physics, taking into account factors such as heat generation, growth rate, internal entropy, and durability of replicators, he was able to present the statistical probability of life emerging from non-life incrementally via chemical means. Putting all of these factors together, he was able to show that when a group of atoms is driven by an external source of energy, such as our sun or chemical fuel, and surrounded by a heat bath, such as an ocean or an atmosphere, it will often gradually restructure itself in order to dissipate increasingly more and more energy. This means that under certain conditions, matter inexorably acquires key physical attributes associated with life. Far from being unquantifiable, evolution is supported by immense amounts of mathematics. From the statistical probability of life's origin, to the calculation of the frequency of a gene pool in a diploid population, to the statistical evaluation of our own behaviors as competitive and altruistic, to the quantification of change as a unit of measure, the math Mathematics allow us to view evolution in action and make predictions on its future developments. These calculations are another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.